was terrible, but these are all high school kids, and there's so much, like, I had, I, I've, I've been there, obviously, you know, you think everything's a big deal, you know, and then, um, ten years later, you're like, oh, that really wasn't that big of a deal, or you, meet a guy when you're 18 and you think that you're going to love him forever and that he's never going to break your heart or cheat on you or be mean to you or anything like that and you know how many high school marriages really last anybody know the percentage because I don't I sure I'm my niece got married today actually um amidst all the stuff that's going on. I'm so happy for her, and I think he's great, and he treats her great, and she's happy, and that makes me happy. But she's not very old, <laughs> so I hope that 50 years from now, they're still married, and give me lots of grand nieces, great, grand, new, whatever. <laughs> anyway, so I'm just gonna dive right in, because I've this is the third video I've filmed tonight, so I've given you all my updates and you're tired of hearing it anyway. I'm going to once again apologize for the craziness that is my hair, but uh, you're not really looking at me anyway, are you? So, in the early morning hours of December 3rd, 1995, a farmer driving along a desolate county road saw the body of a teenage girl on the ground behind a barbed wire fence. This is pretty graphic, so if you don't like it, just skip a little bit. At first, he thought he was looking at roadkill. Her face was nearly unrecognizable. She had a bullet hole in her left cheek and another one in her forehead. She had been hit so hard on the left side of her head that part of her skull was caved in like a pumpkin. She was wearing flannel shorts and a gray t-shirt. Within a few hours, police officers identified her as Adrian Jones, a 16-year-old high school sophomore from the town of Mansfield. Mansfield was a former farming community built around a grain elevator. Mansfield was one of the last places in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that still felt like a small town. In 1984, Bill Jones was looking for a safe place to raise his family. So he moved his wife, Linda, and their three children, Adrian and her two younger brothers, to Mansfield from the Dallas area. He had found a modest neighborhood where the homes were clustered together, and the yards were like little green squares, and the echoey sound of children at play drifted down the street. Jones made his living repairing heavy construction equipment. He's a no-nonsense, bearded man who kept his heavy brown work boots on even when he arrived home at the end of the day. He was also determined to keep a tight leash on his children, especially Adrian, who they called AJ. I truly felt if we had some rules that kept her away from temptation, we'd be okay, he's quoted saying. It was only just that autumn that he allowed AJ to stay out past nine o'clock on the weekends. If she told him she was going to a movie, she had to produce the ticket stub when she got home to prove where she had been. And he had nailed her bedroom windows shut so she couldn't sneak out of the house at night. Now, it could hardly be said that Adrian was a rebel. She took advanced honor courses, studied at least two hours a night, and was a good athlete. She had injured her knee playing for the soccer team, so she joined cross country to get in better shape. I would die if I ran cross country if you ever see me running. You should run, too, because something's probably chasing me. <laughs> she became so good in the two-mile run that she helped the team qualify for the regional meet in Lubbock. She also managed to work 20 hours a week at Golden Fried Chicken, a local fast food restaurant. Her manager said that she was a superstar employee. She was a cashier because she knew how to put a smile on everyone's face. And she liked to say funny things to the customers, like, Drive forward to the 99th window to get your food. Adrian thrived on attention, especially when it came from teenage boys. One of her closest friends called her a big flirt. Her mom, Linda, who is described as a chatty blonde, worked during the day as a massage therapist. Said her daughter would spend two hours putting on makeup just to make it look like she wasn't wearing any. When I asked her why she went to such trouble to put on her makeup before she went out of the house, she said, Mom, you never know who you're going to meet. And of course, there were plenty of guys that wanted to meet Adrian. 
I'm sure all of the guys really liked Adrian. Sydney Jones, a friend and former soccer teammate, said, She was the kind of girl you could say I do in the hallway, or that would say I to you in the hallway, even if you didn't know her. Unfortunately, it was precisely Adrian's popularity that was going to make the investigation into her murder so difficult. Adults who are murdered rarely have more than a couple dozen people that are close to them, but a high school student crosses paths with hundreds of students nearly every day. But it quickly became clear to the detectives that Adrian knew her killer or killers. There was no sign at the crime scene that she'd struggled. No marks on her hands and legs to indicate that she had been restrained. Nor was there any indication someone had broken into her house or gone through her window to abduct her. No evidence found in the autopsy that she was assaulted sexually, which meant that this was not an act of a rapist. Adrian's death, the cops realized, was more like an execution. The result of a colossal fury. One investigator later said, It takes a cold-blooded person to shoot a pretty girl in the face from two to four feet away. That girl was mangled, and it was sickening to look at. Among the nearly 2,500 students at Mans Mansfield High, it didn't take long for rumors to start flying. A lot of us had this weird feeling that the killer was walking among us. A friend of Adrian's named April said, A lot of those were really close to Adrian. We were scared because we thought that she might have been killed because of something she knew. And we thought, well, will they come after us, thinking that she told us? Of course, there were things that, you know, people made up, that she went to parties, and that she met somebody at a rave who wanted to kill her, and she knew drug dealers, and there's so many stories gone around that her dad was quoted saying that just about the only story that they didn't hear was that she was abducted by aliens. So Bill and Linda told the police that on the night of Adrian's death, they had reluctantly allowed her to talk on the phone, past her usual 10 o'clock cutoff time. Her new boyfriend, Tracy Smith, had been out of town that weekend, and he didn't call until 10.30. Bill and Linda didn't know Tracy that well. He was a large kid, built like a lineman for a college football team, and he went to high school in a nearby town. Apparently, they had met a couple months earlier at the Golden Fried Chicken, and Bella told Adrian she could only talk to Tracy but for a few minutes. But during that call, Linda heard her daughter say, Hang on, there's somebody on the other line. Adrian punched the call waiting button and spoke quietly for a minute. Do people still have call waiting? Do people still have house phones? <laughs> she clicked back over and finished her conversation with Tracy. But Linda later asked who had called in. And according to Linda, Adrian replied, Oh, that was David from Cross Country, and he's upset about something. After talking with Tracy, Adrian went to her room. Around 10.45, Linda saw that AJ was still awake, ironing her pants for school the next day, and she seemed sort of antsy. Linda told her to turn off the lights and go to bed. Sometime after midnight, one of Adrian's younger brothers heard the rumble of a slow-moving engine outside the house, and when he looked out the window, he saw what he thought was a pickup truck driving away. The next morning, Adrian was nowhere to be found. And Linda and Bill thought that 
would stare to April as if she were not making sense. Did I talk to Adrian? No, why would I? As their investigation began, the detectives did just a small interview with David Graham, and they were so certain that he wasn't involved that they did not give him a polygraph test. They didn't even try. For one thing, his name wasn't mentioned in her personal phone book, nor did the detectives hear his name mentioned by any of her friends when they asked who might have had a close relationship with her. In fact, Tracy Bumpus said that Adrian told her all of her deepest, darkest secrets, and not once did she ever mention David. And besides, David had supposedly been seen with tears in his eyes at her memorial, seemingly stunned like everyone else that Adrian was gone. Few students really considered themselves good friends with David. We all knew him, but we didn't know him, you know, said Kenny Grant, whose locker was next to David's throughout high school. And he was certainly not part of the school's most popular crowd. But still, he intrigued the other kids. With his military haircut and ramrod posture, he seemed to be a throwback to a different era. He was the youngest of four children. He lived with his father. They were divorced. His parents were divorced. I skipped a line. He, he was divorced from David's mother, Janice, a former teacher who lived in Houston. At the age of seven, when David saw his first air show, he told his father that he was going to become an Air Force pilot. And he never wavered from this dream. Some of the sarcastic kids in school called him Colonel Graham. Um, but you could tell they sort of said it out of respect, added another classmate. He, his classmate David Brennan said he could fall asleep during class, wake up, and still answer the teacher's questions. David Graham might have seemed tailor-made for the military. When he and the others in the ROTC squadron presented colors before a football game, he stood so perfectly still that people tended to watch him instead of the flag. But he never came across as one of those overly aggressive G.I. Joe types. He quit the football team after his freshman year because he didn't have the necessary ferocity to make it in Texas high school football. And the girls liked him for his courtly manners. He had given a couple of them rides home after cross country and always acted like a gentleman. Plenty of girls would have dated David. Apparently, he was one of the last cool guys on earth. But what several of them, or few of them didn't, few of them actually knew, several of them didn't know, is that David had a girlfriend. Her name was Diane Zamora, and she was a high school senior in the nearby town of Crowley. Just as smart as David, and equally determined to get in one of the U.S. military academies. She was a member of student council, the Key Club, the National Honor Society, and a science organization called Masters of the Universe. She played the flute, and like David, ran on her high school's cross-country team. When you looked at the two of them together, one of David's relatives said, you just knew that a great future lay before them. David Graham and Diane Zamora first met four years before Adrian Jones's murder. Despite her good looks, Diane was very careful around guys. She had had a previous boyfriend during her sophomore year, but the relationship was not particularly heated. When the two went out for dinner on Valentine's Day, she asked to be taken home at 8.30 because she needed to study. She kept telling us she wanted to focus on her studies and her goals instead of guys, said her aunt, Sylvia. And she always made it a point to tell us she was never going to lose her virginity unless she got married. When two of her cousins got pregnant in high school, she said she couldn't believe how stupid they were, and she swore that nothing like that would happen to her. So, in a world of high school sexual skirmishing, skirmishing, that's a fun word, Diana firmly put herself into the camp of good girls. A girl who goes too far, she would often say to her family, gets called a slut. When she realized during her sophomore year that her boyfriend was sleeping with other was sleeping with other girls, she dumped him. Diane's father, Carlos, a kind, soft spoken man, was an electrician. Her mother, an RN. The family, deeply religious. Gloria was the daughter of a minister who led a non denominational 
Spanish-speaking church on the south side of Fort Worth. Gloria, her five sisters and their families never missed Sunday services. Diane was the oldest of the Zamora's four children and the most driven. When she was nine, she told her family she wanted to be an astronaut. And she knew exactly what her grade point average and SAT scores needed to be. She carried a knapsack full of school books anywhere in case she got stranded and had time to fill. She was not one of those social girls who gathered between periods of school to gossip. She wasn't considered unfriendly, but she was just someone that kept to herself. She didn't have a lot to say, one student said. She preferred associating with the smart kids at school, homework buddies, as she called them, and she was determined to become an academic star. She did end up in the top 10% of her senior class. Gloria Zamora told her friends that the reason that Diane worked so diligently was because she knew that her parents could not afford to send her to a good college. When her father had gotten laid off, Diane had watched Gloria take on two nursing jobs a day and then sell Mary Kay cosmetics on the side to help pay the family's bills. Apparently, even at one point, the electricity got shut off and Diane studied by candlelight for more than a week. But she was still a teenager still filled with the same impulses and longings as any other girl her age. While she kept civil air patrol military fatigues in her closet, she still had teddy bears on her bed. She took an after-school job at Fast Forward, a store oriented to teenage girls because she liked the discount she could get on hip clothes. Her neighbor said that they thought she was a little naive and sheltered from the outside world. She hadn't experienced anything and didn't understand all the things that could happen to her. And then in August 1995, just before the senior year, start of her senior year, life changed. She told her fa- parents that she had fallen for a boy, David Graham. He was just like her, she said breathlessly. It was not only that they had known as children what they wanted to do with their lives, they both loved calculus, physics, and government, and they talked in, on the phone late at night into their, oh my gosh, talked on the phone late into the night about their homework. Their feelings, well known to any adolescent, were a mixture of adoration and possessiveness. When they were together, they never stopped touching. Diane would put her arm around his waist, slide a finger into his belt loop, and he would encircle her with his arms. He always had both arms around her, like he was afraid she was going somewhere, Diane's aunt Sylvia quoted. They looked like they were wrapped up in each other. Of course, it wasn't difficult for Diane and David to be swept away by the romantic grandeur of their relationship. By then, they were stars of the Civil Air Patrol. David was a cadet colonel in the CAP's youth division, the highest accolade given, and Diane was a wing secretary. They saw themselves as the top guns of the 21st century. David saw himself becoming a great fighter pilot, and Diane a famous astronaut. She abandoned her plans to study physics at an academy academically, I cannot write nor speak, at an academically elite major university and applied to the Air Force Academy, where David was set on going. When she learned that the deadline had passed for applications, she applied to the Naval Academy with the intention of transferring her commission after graduation from the Navy to the Air Force so she could be stationed with David. Diane's family, of course, knew that David's personality was a little different. He had a collection of hunting rifles, which he once brought over to their house. And when he came to church with Diane, he wore combat boots, pants, and a t-shirt, and kept his arms closely around her through the service. He once showed up at the Zamora's home with a couple of his ROTC buddies from Mansfield and for entertainment. 
driving David's pickup truck, and it required pins to be put in her left hand. He spent entire nights at the hospital with her. And unlike that other boyfriend of hers who just wanted to go all the way, David genuinely cared for Diane. I don't think Diane ever had that kind of attention, another relative said. That September, about a month after they started dating, they told Diane's parents that they were engaged. David sold a couple of his hunting rifles to make a down payment for an engagement ring. They were going to get married August 13th of 2000, after they graduated from their military academies. They all already had the wedding all planned. They were going to charter a bus to carry their relatives in Texas to the famous Cadet Chapel on the Air Force Academy's campus. David would wear his uniform, Diane would wear a white dress, and at the end of the ceremony they would walk under the cross swords that were held by other cadets. Not long after they announced their engagement, Diane lost her virginity to David, an act that had a dramatic impact on her life. After it was over, she was really confused by what happened, a relative said. I know she felt guilty because she wanted to wait, but once she went through with it, she became more committed than ever to David. I remember her saying, if I can't be Mrs. David Graham, then I will die as Miss Diane Zamora. Indeed, they were hopelessly in love, as focused as laser beams on each other. And in that classic teenage way, they developed their own secret love code. She called him Tiger, and he called her Kittens. And they ended many of their telephone conversations with the words, Greenish-Brown Female Sheep. <laughs> Greenish-Brown is the color of an olive, and a female shape is a you. Olive, you. I love you. Cheesy is cute, but sad. Anyway. <laughs> the first weekend in November, David traveled to Lubbock with the other members of the Mansfield High Cross County team for a regional meet. Both the boys and the girls squad had qualified, and the school provided them a large van for the trip. Oh, I really hope you can hear that. One of the students that went on that trip was Adrian Jones. In many ways, Adrian was Diane's polar opposite. She knew how to charm the guys and get them to look twice at her. When she posed for one studio portrait, she made sure to show a little cleavage. <laughs> Although she was far from sexually naive, she wasn't promiscuous, not in such a way that it would make her an outcast among the more popular girls. Diane, on the other hand, rarely put on makeup for school and, with the exception of David, thought high school guys were immature. It's not known if anything happened between Adrian and David in Lubbock. No one remembers if they sat next to each other on the van or stayed up late talking in the motel. Some of Adrian's friends seemed to think that she would have kept her distance from David. One friend pointed out that Adrian had her standards and she would never sleep with another girl's boyfriend. But something did happen when they returned to Mansfield. For whatever reason, Adrian asked David to give her a ride home. And they didn't go straight to her house. She surprised him by asking him to take some turns that he knew were out of the way. And they ended up behind an elementary school where he parked the car. And they slept together. Apparently, they didn't tell anybody and their encounter seemed to have been an impulsive one-night thing. But a month later, late in the evening, a friend of David's who lived in the nearby town of Burleson heard tapping at his window. David and Diane, their clothes bloodied, came through the window. According to the friend, David begged him to ask no questions, but he of course noticed that they were both upset. David was throwing up, and Diane had to help him take a shower. And then they just laid on the floor and held each other. This was the same night that Adrian Jones disappeared from her house and was murdered. But this friend, he never reported the incident to the police. And soon David and Diane were back to their old ways. Using his father's credit card, David bought Diane and Gloria leather coats as Christmas presents and he got Diane's engagement ring out of layaway so she could wear it. Diane's family couldn't help but wonder about the relationship as it progressed. They seemed so absorbed in one another's lives, so absorbed.
was always talking about David this or David that. One night when they were apart, David didn't call, and Diane tearfully begged her mother to call to see if anything terrible had happened to him. But David was no different. He came over every afternoon to run with Diane, and some nights would stay so late he'd fall asleep on the couch. And his father would call and demand that he came home, but he would dawdle for hours before leaving. Whenever Diane had a school function to go to at night, he would phone every hour from his home until she got back. That spring, they learned within days of each other they had been accepted to their academies, David to the Air Force and Diane to the Navy. Um, at special ceremonies at their high schools, they were presented with their academy acceptance letters. And for her part, Gloria was proud of what her daughter had done. When she spoke with David and Diane, a reporter, Rosanna Ruiz, asked them if they were being realistic about being married in five years, considering they'd be so far apart. But the two insisted they would stay in touch daily through email. The reporter said, I was surprised how adamant they were. They were certain the marriage was going to happen, and they were not going to get on the outs. And they stopped and looked at one another. In the summer of 1996, nearly 300 interviews later, detectives on the case put it in slowdown mode. Bill and Linda Jones sank deeper into despair. Bill had to restrain himself from interrogating every teenager he saw, and Linda would get in her car at night and drive to the south where Adrian was found, hoping she would come across the killer. Apparently, every day she, um, or something of Adrian's, where it was makeup or shoes or clothes, um, to keep the spirit of her daughter alive. By all indications, David successfully completed his basic cadet training in Colorado Springs. According to relatives who read them, Diane's letters home indicated she was capably enduring a plebe summer in Annapolis. She wrote in the detail about our daily schedule, from the 90-minute calisthenic sessions at 6 in the morning to evening drill where they marched with M16 rifles. She was going to church at the Naval Chapel, and she joined the glee club. But our squad leader, a man named Jay Guild, said that Diane wasn't physically keeping up with the other plebes, and that she was mo emotionally distracted. She liked to talk about David, he said. She missed him a lot, and she often talked about him very strangely, as if she didn't trust him, but still wanted to be with him. It was very odd. He said that she went on crying fits when David wouldn't answer her email, and told him that she suspected he was cheating on her with a female cadet at the Air Force Academy. Of course, it was the first time they'd been apart since they began dating, so she became plagued with jealousy and decided in turn to make David jealous. So she stopped emailing him for several days. She told him that um, her computer had been broken. A few weeks into the plebe summer, Jay added that Diana told him she was considering breaking up with him, and that she suggested that the two of them become boyfriend and girlfriend. And she sent David an email telling him that Jay had kissed her. found such security in their all-consuming devotion seemed to be whirling out of control. When David heard about Diane and Jay, he attempted to contact the naval officials to inform them that he was sexually harassing her. He sent a threatening email to Jay, demanding that he have nothing more to do with Diane. And one person close to the investigation said that David wrote Diane letters and begged her not to deceive him. And in the letters he would say, Remember what binds us together. It was clear that Jay was captivated by Diane. Somehow, Diane's parents and Jay's mother all went to dinner together. And they were told that Jay and Diane had been reprimanded by upperclassmen for excessive fraternizing. He'd been found sitting on the edge of her bed at night in Bancroft Hall. The truth was that Gloria was relieved to hear about Jay and Diane. She said that she got a very strong feeling that... Well, no. Jay's mother said, I had a very strong feeling that Diane's parents felt the relationship between Diane and David had become unhealthy. And apparently, Gloria said to Cheryl, I wish that she had met Jay first. Jay at one point said, that in the summer, he asked Diane if David had ever 
cheated? And she said yes. And he asked her, what did you do about it? And she told me that she had asked David to murder the other girl. Jay was stunned by this and he listened as Diane told him that she had watched David kill a girl named Adrian. She never said that she participated. All she said was that she told him to do it and she watched him do it. Jay um he didn't tell anybody. The academy had a strict honor code and it says that a midship is shipmen must immediately report another midshipman who lies, cheats, or breaks the law in any way. He didn't tell anybody, like I said, and was eventually asked to resign from the academy because of his silence. He said that he didn't believe her and thought maybe she was trying to get attention, and that's why he never reported it. But in late August, Diane told the story again, this time to two of her roommates. They were having a late night conversation and one of the girls mentioned how that he seems so in love and the one roommate said I bet you would do anything for one another Diane replied yes even kill for one another the roommate asked Diane paused we have she said and then she told him the story of Adrian whether it was out of guilt or pride sure. Initially, the two roommates were skeptical about what they heard, but the next day they nervously told a Navy chaplain about the conversation. He contacted a Navy attorney at the academy, who then began calling police departments in the Dallas-Fort Worth area to ask if they had an unsolved murder of a teenage girl. On August 29th, he contacted the Grand Prairie Police Department, and the next morning detectives were on a flight to Annapolis. They pulled Diane out of her first pep rally of the season for the Navy's football team. Diane was escorted down a long hallway and was led into a room where several detectives and Navy officials waited. She admitted to nothing. She said that she'd been insecure throughout plebe summer and thought that a tale of murder would make her look tougher in the eyes of the other plebes. The cops didn't buy it, but what could they do? They didn't have any evidence. So she was temporarily suspended from the Navy and sent home until the matter was straightened out. They gave her an airplane ticket that took her from Baltimore to Atlanta to Dallas, but when she reached Atlanta, she changed planes and flew to Colorado Springs, where she went to see David. Nobody knows what was said between them, but they did have their photograph taken. David was wearing his Air Force uniform and Diane her naval outfit. And... They looked at the camera with a nearly desperate look, as if they knew this was their last time together. That the fairy tale was over. When the detectives arrived in Colorado Springs, David insisted he couldn't imagine why Diane would tell such a blatantly false story. But the cops told him they had found his friend in Pearlson and heard the story of the bloody clothing. And then, Air Force officers told the young cadet he had a duty to reveal the truth. Finally, David broke. He sat down at a word processor and typed a four-and-a-half-page confession that one forensic pathologist, or psychologist, sorry, would later equate to a Danielle Steele novel. He wrote that for a month after his evening with Adrian, he was tormented by guilt and shame. The perfect, pure relationship between him and Diane had been defiled by the one girl who had stolen from us our purity. Eventually, he told Diane about his tryst. For at least an hour, she screamed, sobs that I wouldn't have thought possible. She banged her head on the floor and pounded her fists and said, kill her, kill her, kill her. It wasn't just jeal jealousy. For Diane, she had been betrayed, deceived, and forgotten. He said Diane gave him an ultimatum. Kill Adrian. And he agreed. I didn't have any harsh feelings for Adrian. 
since I knew I couldn't leave the key witness to our crime alive. I pointed and shot. I fired again and ran to the car. Diane and I drove out. And the first things out of our mouths were, I love you. And then Diane, her thirst for revenge suddenly slated, said, We shouldn't have done that, David. recovered the handgun along with several dumbbells from the attic of the Graham's home. They confronted Diane, who by then was back in Texas. She stared at the police officers, then quietly went to the station to give her own confession. She was put in solitary on a separate floor from David. Every day, she did sit-ups and push-ups in her cell. She asked her mother for history and government books so she could continue her studies. Bill and Linda Jones had to change their phone number to avoid phone calls from reporters. One producer explained that it was like a modern-day Romeo and Juliet, only they kill someone else instead of each other. What remained unfathomable, unfathomable, <laughs> I should stop talking now, was how they could convince themselves that only death would eliminate the one blot on their perfect love affair. How could they manage to imagine that sexual betrayal was a far worse crime than murder? It seems clear that David convinced Diane that Adrian was a seductress who lured him behind the elementary school. According to one police source, just before Diane hit Adrian in the head, she looked at her and said, I know who you are, and I know what you've done. Diane's two-week trial began February 1998. Adrian's mother asked that the death penalty be removed as a sentencing option from both trials. Diane admitted to being at the scene of the crime, but denied participating in killing Adrian. Um, witnesses have stated that she showed no remorse for Adrian's death. I can't even get my head around it. Anyway, on February 17, 1998, after more than six hours of deliberation over two days, the jury found Diane guilty of capital murder and the death of Adrian Jones. They did not seek the death penalty, and she received a mandatory sentence of life in prison, eligible for parole after 40 years. On July 24, 1998, after a separate trial, a jury found David guilty of capital murder. He apparently did show remorse, and it was odd because there were a couple people on the track team that said that he did not drive Adrian home on the night he claimed to have sex with her, and then he denied it and then said that he did do it, and so no one really knows if he actually did have sex with her. sentenced to life in prison. So they're saying that maybe he didn't have sex with her that night after the meet, but that he may have had sex with her at some other time. I thought it was kind of weird that David is now, he shows remorse. He said that if he could do it over again, he would have changed things and he would have also pled guilty to murder, which I don't understand. But I found one other fact kind of Obviously, they're both in jail, but Diane actually got to know a man named Stephen Mora through the mail. 
for this one guys and you know I talk a lot 